Hello and welcome. This is my wife, Mary, and I'm Ed, and we are Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. We are excited that you're joining us today. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School Quarterly each week. This fourth quarter of 2018 deals with the topic of unity, a subject of supreme interest to the Seventh-day Adventist Church as schisms over ideologies and doctrines are abounding. This week's topic is unity in worship. We will bring up a very well-known verse about worship that actually the Sabbath School Quarterly did not bring up, but it is of profound importance to understand. It is in John chapter 4 as part of the account of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. In verse 24, Jesus says to her, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Now in all honesty, this is one of those verses that I never gave much thought to. It is one of those lines that sounds nice, but I had no idea what it meant. I was a Bible reader and all, but I figured I was saved because I already knew Jesus was the Messiah and the woman at the well did not. So I figured I didn't really need to understand what Jesus was saying to her because, well, it was something he was saying to her, an unbeliever. And I was a believer, so I was good. But verse 23 says, For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Wow, if this is the kind of worshiper the Father seeks, we had better know what it is to worship in spirit and in truth. Exactly. This is what makes it personal to all of us. It was not just intended for the woman at the well. We all had better know what it means if this is the kind of worshiper the Father wants. So first of all, what does it mean that God is spirit? Does it mean a vapor? Does it mean God is something immaterial? Is God made up of something non-physical? When I was a Catholic, and then as an evangelical Protestant, I thought the word spirit meant something immaterial, something that had no substance. I thought I had an immaterial essence that lived inside of me and went to heaven or hell when I died. I believed that my spirit was somehow different from my brain and body, and was the non-tangible part of me that lived forever. This is part of spiritualism. Spiritualism is actually the belief that our spirit is a non-physical but real part of us. So spiritualism is the belief in a non-physical realm. It is the belief that a non-physical realm exists and that our spirit is part of this supposed realm. So what about God? Doesn't he exist in a non-physical realm? Isn't he immaterial? Isn't that what Jesus meant when he said, God is spirit? The word spirit in this verse is pneuma. Outside of the New Testament, the Greeks used the word pneuma to mean life, discerned in movement, like how the wind is a blowing force. It is tied up with breathing. It was in a direct sense, the breath of life, or a living creature. For example, we know that angels are spirits. Hebrews 1, 7 says, And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? And Matthew 4, 6 says, and the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So here we can see that the angels are spirits, and they have hands, so they are not an immaterial essence. They are real physical beings. So also, with anything described as a spirit in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the weight of evidence is that a spirit is a physical, material, living, breathing being in a corporeal sense. And God's spirit is seen as a life-giving spirit in the Old and New Testaments. Spirit in the Old Testament is regularly not in order of being over and against matter, but life-giving creative activity. And it is in this sense that John commonly uses the word pneuma. So this is saying that the word spirit in the Old Testament is not ever intended to define someone that is made of nothing, but somehow is something. No, the word is used to mean life-giving creative activity. So let's take this information and back up a bit in the scene in John. In verse 10, Jesus says this to the Samaritan woman at the well after she is shocked that Jesus, a Jew, would ask her, a Samaritan, for a drink of water. Verse 10 says, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Jesus then proceeds to let her know that he knows about her past and all her former husbands in order to help her realize who it is that speaks with her. She quickly discerns that Jesus is a prophet and diverts the conversation to a theological controversy about the proper location for worship. Is it Mount Gerizim, where Moses said to worship, or is it Jerusalem, where Solomon was instructed to build the temple? Jesus then shows her that this controversy represented a dead form of worship. Notice that even before the cross, before the curtain was rent from top to bottom, before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, Jesus said this, 
Verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus was telling her, worship is not a dead formalism. It was not intended to be about where people were worshiping. Obviously, this was never the intention of the Father, since the true Jews, who had the light of the Holy Spirit through the prophets, knew what they worshiped. Samaritans only received the scriptures up to Moses. They rejected the rest of the progression of prophecy. They did not have the light on this matter. Many who called themselves Jews in that day also did not have the light on this matter, as they should have, because most of them rejected the prophets of their day as well, as can be seen by the rejection of Jesus and others. But Jesus was telling her that the Jews did indeed have the light. It was them that the Holy Spirit was guiding, if they would only recognize and receive it, so they could give light and life and truth to the rest of the world. Much like today, it is the Seventh-day Adventists that the prophets are given to, if we will only recognize them and receive that light as well. So again, Jesus was telling her that worship is not a dead formalism. It was not intended to be about where people were worshiping. Some people think that Jesus was telling her that God is immaterial, that he can be everywhere at once, all of a sudden, and that is why worship is not dependent on any particular location anymore. But since there are instances of specific locations mentioned in the scriptures, especially of God's dwelling place, this could not be the case, because that would mean that God was material, as evidenced by physical location mentioned in the past, and now God is immaterial, as evidenced by there being no particular location of worship in the present. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The scriptures say that God is, and was, and always will be a material being. James White points this out in his article called The Personality of God. He cites Exodus 33, 21 through 23, in which God has a hand and a face and back parts, and Exodus 24, 9 through 11, where God tells Moses that he shall see his form. He also points to John 5, 37, Philippians 2, 6, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, to support his thesis. When facing an objection to the physicality of God through the contention that God is a spirit in the verse we are looking at, John 4, 24, he points to Psalm 104, 4, showing that angels are also spirits and have physical hands and actually took hold of Lot's hand, which something non-physical could not do. But if God is physical, that means he could only be in one place at one time. How is God everywhere? Well, J.N. Loughborough, one of the Adventist pioneers, answers this question in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald in 1858. When asked if God is everywhere, he said, But we inquire, is not God in one place more than another? Oh no, say you, the Bible says he is a spirit, and if so, he must be everywhere alike. But the Bible certainly represents God as located in heaven, Psalm 102, 19. Then certainly heaven cannot be everywhere, for God is represented as looking down from it. There is much more to both of these articles by James White and Jan Loughborough, which we would be happy to send to you in PDF form via the email address provided at the beginning and end of these videos. We would also be happy to speak with you personally if you request it through the email address provided. But this should be enough of their quotes to satisfactorily demonstrate that our pioneers believed that scripture and logic both dictate that God is indeed a physical being, not able to be in all places at once, save for the ministry of the all-important physical angels and the ministry of the saints, the all-important human ambassadors of the three angels' messages. Now back to John 4.24. So in this encounter, Jesus' initial intention was to parallel physical water with spiritual life. Trent Wilde, prophet to the Seventh-day Adventists, said this about Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. Christ was purposing to let her know her need of life and instruct her as to where she could obtain such life. His method of letting her know who he was was to reveal to her his own knowledge of her personal affairs. As it would be with most, she did not desire to stay on that topic for long. Therefore, she grabbed on to the thought that surely a prophet will know the answer to our theological controversies. In this, Christ was able to point out to her the degenerate state of her own religious system and how it had been turned into a dead formalism. He then directed her attention to the fact that God is full of life and indeed life-giving, and that those whom he seeks to worship him must also be full of life and life-giving. To say John 4.24 in another way, Trent says, 
God is full of life and life-giving, and they that worship him must worship him full of life and life-giving and in truth. We must love life and give life. In other words, love righteousness and be selfless, love others more than ourselves, and love the truth. That is the kind of worshiper God is seeking. The source of all of this is the Spirit of God, the tree of life, the one who leads us into all truth. Thank you for staying with us through the entire video. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com, to learn more about who we are and, just as important, who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath school studies. God bless. Many blessings.